I'm sure he's had some of that. Yeah. I'm sure he's. Good afternoon. A hearty uh, welcome back to our colleague Sean. Missed you. I uh, have a few things at the top, and then we'll turn to your questions. Uh, first, as the White House announced, President Biden will host the leaders of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, in Washington, D.C., May 12th through the 13th for a U.S. ASEAN Special Summit. The special summit will showcase the strong and enduring U.S. commitment to ASEAN, recognizing its central role in delivering sustainable solutions to the region's most pressing challenges, and commemorate 45 years of U.S.-ASEAN relations. The summit will build on President Biden's participation in the October 2021 ASEAN-U.S. Summit, where the President announced $102 million in new initiatives to expand U.S. engagement with ASEAN and support a bright and prosperous future for our combined one billion people. One of this administration's top priorities is to serve as a strong, reliable partner and to strengthen an empowered and unified ASEAN to address the challenges of our time. Our shared interests for the region will continue to underpin our common commitment to advance an Indo-Pacific that is free, open, connected, prosperous, secure, and resilient. Next, as the White House also announced this morning, Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs Daniel Crittenbrink and National Security Council Indo-Pacific Coordinator Kurt Campbell will lead a delegation of U.S. government officials to Fiji, Papua New Guinea, and the Solomon Islands this week. Building on Secretary Blinken's February 2022 visit to the region, the delegation will reaffirm the U.S. commitment to a free and open Indo-Pacific as we work together to tackle the most significant global challenges of the 21st century, including combating the climate crisis and ending the acute phase of the COVID-19 pandemic. The interagency delegation will also hold consultations with regional partners at the headquarters of U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, or Indo-PACOM, in Honolulu, Hawaii. And finally, today, the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs is launching an online partnership with the Google Arts and Culture platform to showcase the Cultural Heritage Center's work to protect and preserve cultural heritage around the world. The partnership launches today in celebration of World Heritage Day. The Col Cultural Heritage Center's first exhibition on the U.S. platform features the U.S. Ambassadors Fund for Cultural Preservation Program. Visitors can virtually tour multiple AFCP sites, such as Chanquillo, Chanquillo in Peru, the earliest known astronomical observatory in the Americas, or Wat Chawat Tanram, a 17th century Buddhist temple in Thailand. The State Department works with international partners to preserve heritage and protect culturally important sites, objects, and practices. This community engagement spurs economic development, cultivates respect for cultural diversity, and further promotes U.S. foreign policy objectives. Since 2001, the U.S. Ambassadors Fund has worked with partners in over 130 countries to protect and preserve cultural heritage through more than 1,100 preservation projects. So, with all of that at the top, happy to take your questions. Sean, uh, welcome back again. Thank you, thanks. Uh, perhaps starting in Ukraine, uh, the situation in Lviv, um, 77 people were killed. Uh, Russia is saying that it was targeting uh, arms there. Do you have any assessment about what the Russian aim was about and about what the, um, what the effects were? Well, I would in large part refer you to our Ukrainian partners and our Department of Defense to speak to uh, Russia's military activity. I know that our Department of Defense has said uh, as of this morning that uh, many of the Russian strikes we've seen in recent days have targeted military installations, military adjacent installations. But the fact is that Russia, more than just launching an invasion, more than just launching a war, uh, has launched, is undertaking uh, a campaign of terror, a campaign of brutality, uh, a campaign of despicable aggression against the people of Ukraine. And so when it comes to what we've seen in recent hours in, in terms of the strikes against Lviv, 
in terms of uh, the strikes on the outskirts of Kyiv, or what we've seen in towns like Mariupol, towns like Kharkiv, what we've witnessed in Bucha. Uh, this, these are clear indications. They are a clear testament to the campaign of brutality, the cam campaign of terror uh, that the Russians are waging against the people of Ukraine. I wonder, on, just to follow up on that, does that those attacks on Kyiv and uh, Lviv, does that, do you, do you see that as a kind of setback for, um, you know, these, it seemed like things had been um, improving in that part of the country and, you know, a lot of Ukrainians were crossing the border the other way. You know, is that is that a setback to those people who, you know, those Ukrainians who might be, th might have been thinking, you know, it's safe to go back if we're from uh, the west of the country? And, and also is that, how does that factor into your um, considerations on whether to uh, re-establish diplomatic presence in the country? Well, at a strategic level, uh, we, of course, will re-establish a diploma diplomatic presence just as soon as we are able. Uh, when it comes to our calculus, you know that we have a high priority on the safety and security, the welfare, the well-being of American diplomats uh, and our colleagues who are serving around the world. Uh, so we are continuing to assess the security situation, uh, and when the security situ situation allows it and not a second later, uh, I can assure you that we will have a reestablished diplomatic presence on the ground uh, in Ukraine. In the meantime, I wouldn't want to offer the misimpression that the lack of a formal diplomatic presence, the lack of a diplomatic team on the ground, has in any way encumbered our ability to coordinate, to consult with our Ukrainian partners. We do that as a matter of course. As you know, we have a team, a diplomatic team, uh, stationed uh, across the border in Poland. Uh, they have been engaging regularly with their Ukrainian counterparts uh, at the highest levels. We have been engaging regularly with our diplomatic counterparts over the phone and even in person. President Biden spoke uh, to President Zelensky last week. Secretary Blinken spoke uh, to Foreign Minister Kuleba last week. Uh, and as you know, Secretary Blinken has had recent opportunities to meet with uh, Foreign Minister Kuleba in person. We did so in Brussels on the margins of the NATO ministerial uh, just the other week. We did so just before that uh, in Warsaw when Secretary Blinken accompanied uh, the president and uh, he and Secretary Austin did a two plus two uh, with their Ukrainian counterparts. We did so just before that uh, when we met with Foreign Minister Kuleba just inside Ukrainian territory along the Polish-Ukrainian uh, border. Uh, so even as we don't have uh, a uh, diplomatic presence on the ground at the moment, uh, we are continuing to work closely with our Ukrainian counterparts uh, to hear precisely uh, what they need to determine how best we can continue to uh, support them in terms of our security assistance, in terms of our humanitarian assistance, in terms of our economic support, uh, and uh, as we coordinate with 30 countries across four continents uh, to hold the Russian Federation to account uh, for this, this war of choice. Yes. Russia as a state funds of terrorism. Will the U.S. accept this? So I will call the next. Let, let me start with that question just because it's adjacent to, to Simon's question. Uh, as, I mo as I mentioned just a moment ago, we have worked with some 30 countries across four continents uh, to impose unprecedented costs on the Russian Federation with our economic sanctions, other economic measures, including our expert export control uh, measures. We are going to look at all potential options, options that are available to us under the law, op options that would be effective. Uh, in holding Russia uh, to account. And if a tool is available and effective, uh, we won't hesitate uh, to use it. When it comes to the DPRK's most recent provocations, I know that the Department of Defense uh, issued a statement on this. They uh, noted that the department was aware of the DPRK's statement, that they conducted a test of a long-range artillery system. Uh, as you know, we're closely monitoring uh, the situation on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, and uh, we have warned of the possibility of additional 
uh, potential provocations from the DPRK. It just so happens that our special envoy for the DPRK is currently in Seoul. He did, uh, he had a series of meetings in Seoul earlier today. He uh, spoke publicly as well to make the point that his engagement with our ROK allies showcases the coordination and underscores our rock solid commitment to the region. Uh, Sung Kim, Ambassador Sung Kim, Sung, Sung Kim went on to say that we're determined to protect the security of the United States and that of our allies, the ROK and Japan. And he noted that our goal continues to be the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Sung Kim, Deputy Secretary Sherman, Secretary Blinken have engaged regularly, bilaterally, with our ROK counterparts, bilaterally with our uh, Japanese allies, trilaterally uh, with our ROK uh, and Japanese allies uh, together. We have, in all of those engagements, sought to make very clear to the DPRK that the door to diplomacy is not closed, that it does remain open, but that the DPRK needs to cease its destabilizing actions and instead choose the path of engagement, something it has not yet done. We are willing to listen to the full range of the DPRK's concerns, but this can only happen through dialogue. And the DPRK has not yet given any concrete indications that it is open uh, to this dialogue. They have done this notwithstanding the fact that we've made clear on many occasions, including right here, that we harbor no hostile intent towards the DPRK. And we've also made clear that we are willing to meet without preconditions uh, to engage in this dialogue. Unfortunately, it is the DPRK that has failed to respond to our invitations. And instead, uh, they've engaged in this series of provocations, including uh, the ICBM launches in recent weeks. We have worked with our allies in the region. We've worked with our allies uh, well beyond the region. And we've worked in the UN context to make clear our condemnation of these recent ballistic missiles, missile tests each of which was in violation of multiple UN Security Council resolutions. Uh, these launches, these tests have demonstrated that the DPRK continues to prioritize its WMD and ballistic missile programs at the expense of regional and international uh, security. And in response to these provocations uh, in whole and in part, uh, we have taken a series of diplomatic, economic, and military measures. We've uh, detailed them uh, in, in uh, some depth, both from here uh, and throughout this uh, administration. Our actions are intended to make clear to the DPRK that its escalatory behavior has consequences. Uh, those consequences will continue as long as uh, the DPRK continues with its provocations. So last question. So China is a special representative for North Korea's uh, nuclear program opposes additional UN Security Council sanctions on North Korea and retaliated that the US and North Korea should resume early dialogue. What is your comment? China always say that they need the dialogue, resume the dialogue, but they, they not help, they not all of the no, well, when it comes to the latter element, that's also been our point. Uh, we have made very clear that the door to diplomacy, the door to dialogue remains open. We have signaled that publicly. We have signaled that privately. But as I just detailed, the DPRK has yet to engage uh, on those suggestions. We have engaged not only with our close allies, Japan and the ROK, uh, but also with uh, other uh, stakeholders, including regional stakeholders. And of course, uh, the PRC is an important regional stakeholder. We recently had a meeting uh, with the PRC's special envoy for the DPRK. It's important that we continue uh, to engage partners like uh, the uh, PRC on this, given that the PRC does wield a good degree of leverage uh, with the uh, DPRK. Yes. Right. I have two questions. One is uh, regarding uh, Pakistan attack. Recent, uh attack to Afghanistan, uh, so many civilian has been killed, although we experience, uh, like uh, we are during the Ramadan uh, month, holy month. I don't know if State Department or U United States still have influences to Pakistan, especially the new government. Uh, what uh, can the United States do to bring pressure to Pakistan uh, 
uh, regime to change their policy toward Afghanistan. And the second question about the SIV visa holder, the people who approved already, but they said we don't want our kids in Afghanistan to be with the Taliban and come to the United States. I need to. So on your first question, we're aware of the reports of Pakistani airstrikes in Afghanistan, but we refer you to the Pakistani government uh, for comment. We view Pakistan uh, as an important stakeholder, an important partner uh, with whom we are engaging and have engaged uh, as we work together uh, to bring about an Afghanistan that is more stable, is more secure, is more prosperous, and importantly, uh, in Afga Afghanistan that respects the basic and fundamental rights of its people, all of its people, including its minorities, uh, its women, its girls. Uh, for almost 75 years, our relationship with Pakistan has been a vital one. Uh, we look forward to continuing that work with the new government in Pakistan across regional uh, and international uh, issues. This is work that uh, has the potential to promote peace and prosperity in Pakistan uh, and throughout the region. We've already uh, congratulated the new Pakistani Prime Minister, Shabazz Sharif, uh, on his election. Uh, and we look, uh, we work, excuse me, we look forward to working closely uh, with his government. When it comes to the SIV program, we've spoke to this, spoken to this in, in some length. Uh, but of course, in addition to uh, US citizens, lawful permanent residents, uh, we are prioritizing uh, the relocation for those uh, who have partnered with the United States uh, over the course of the last 20 years. Uh, and SIV holders are uh, uh, certainly in that category. The SIV program is actually not a program that we ourselves designed uh, or we ourselves uh, formulated. Uh, if we had, uh, there would probably be some uh, differences. And we've talked about the rather cumbersome process when it comes to the SIV program, more than a dozen steps involving different agencies within the US government uh, that uh, ladders up to uh, the application and ultimately the selection of uh, SIV uh, applicants. So under the law, and this was a program that was designed by Congress, uh, there are certain dependents uh, who are able to uh, travel uh, and to relocate with an SIV holder. Uh, and so we are required to follow the law, uh, and that does not afford us flexibility in terms of family members uh, that might be able to travel uh, with the SIV holder. Uh, the law clearly stipulates that it's a spouse uh, and adult children uh, under the age of, uh, and children under the age of 21, as I recall. Sean, uh, let me m move around a little bit, actually. Yes, sir. From Azerbaijan, Real TV, Natik Mailoğlu. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, Russia and uh, France. Uh, France removed uh, their uh, co-chairs um, from the OSCE uh, Minsk group. Um, uh, when will the U.S. Um, uh, do the same? And generally, what will be the fate of the Minsk group? Uh, second question, how can the United States contribute to the, to the signing um, of peace agreement between Azerbaijan and Armenia? Well, we spoke about this uh, a bit last week, and Secretary Blinken had an opportunity to speak respectively with the leaders of Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, a couple weeks ago now. But we remain committed to promoting a peaceful, democratic, and prosperous future for the South Caucasus region. We urge Armenia and Azerbaijan to continue to intensify their diplomatic engagement and to make use of existing mechanisms for direct engagement, to find comprehensive solutions to all outstanding issues related to or resulting from the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, and to normalize their relations through the conclusion of a comprehensive peace agreement. Uh, when it comes to our role, we do remain ready to assist uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan with these efforts, including in our capacity as a co-chair of the OSCE Minsk Group. And so when we talk about existing mechanisms, of course, uh, the OSCE's uh, Minsk Group uh, is, is part of that. Uh, yes, sure. In the region right now, and I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, Andy Schofer is currently in the region, and he met with Armenian uh, uh, Foreign Affairs Minister. There was a confusion, I think, uh, in terms of what badge is he wearing today. Uh, State Department put a tweet out there and said he is a senior advisor for Caucasus negotiations, and we know him in the region as the Minsk Group co-chair. Uh, Keeps clarified that, and also is he going to go to Azerbaijan as well? I don't have the details on this individual's travel or in what capacity he was acting uh, at the time, but we'll get back to you if we have anything more to add there. Yes. Yeah. 
on, on which I want to follow up. Um, Putin uh, today awarded the brigade that uh, committed a mass murder in Bucha um, as a title of guards. Uh, is there any reaction from the state? And also, what is the state of U.S. investigation on Bucha massacre? Thank you. What is the status of the U.S. investigation? Investigation into on Bucha. Uh, so on your first question, the question was, do we have a reaction to President Putin uh, reportedly heralding uh, one of the architects of uh, the, the massacre, the, uh, what has transpired in, in Bucha. We don't have a specific reaction to that, but what I can tell you is that uh, it, is, it would not be surprising uh, to see the Russian Federation herald honor those who uh, may have been involved in some of the worst atrocities of this conflict, because the point we have made is that the atrocities, uh, to include war crimes, that Russia, Russia's forces have committed these are not the rogue acts of a single Russian service member or uh, even a small group. Uh, these, this was a premeditated, uh, preconceived campaign of brutality against not only, not targeting not only the government of Ukraine, the territorial integrity uh, of the state of Ukraine, but also the people of Ukraine. Uh, and that is why we are so focused on accountability, not only on those who are responsible uh, with, uh, uh, through their own hands uh, and their own work, uh, through the deaths and the destruction uh, in Ukraine's towns and cities, uh, but also all of those uh, up the ladder who were part and sanctioned uh, this effort of brutality uh, against the people uh, of Ukraine. Yes. CIA director called China a silent partner in Putin's uh, war of aggression in Ukraine. Is the U.S. giving any consideration to increasing the nature of its diplomatic pressure on China, changing its tactics in order to um, bring the Chinese around to ending their tacit support for Russia? Well, the PRC is going to make its own decisions uh, about how it supports Russia's brutality against the people of Ukraine. The PRC is going to make its own decisions about whether everything that it has purported to stand for in the international system in recent decades, including an emphasis uh, on state sovereignty and the ability and the uh, and viability of borders, or whether all of that was just a show, just bluster. Uh, and to the director's point, uh, not only have we not seen the PRC uh, condemn, as every country around the world should, the brutality that Russia's forces are carrying out on the Ukrainian, against the Ukrainian people. We've actually heard senior PRC officials parrot some of the worst, some of the most dangerous propaganda uh, that is and has emanated from the Kremlin. Uh, so this is a choice for the PRC to make. The point that the United States and our European allies and our partners around the world uh, have made to the PRC, a couple. Number one, we are going to continue uh, to keep a careful eye, a careful watch on the level of support uh, for uh, the PRC exhibits towards Russia. Uh, of course, if uh, the PRC were to provide uh, weapons, supplies, uh, or seek, uh, would seek to help uh, Russia uh, evade sanctions, uh, there would be strong consequences for that, not only on our part, uh, but also on the part of our allies uh, and partners. But number two, uh, this is a moment when every responsible country around the world has an obligation to its people and to the international community to make clear where it stands on questions that are fundamental and questions on which there should be no nuance. Questions about whether uh, these types of, uh, this type of brutality, uh, these wanton human rights abuses, uh, the massacring of civilians, the ability of a state uh, to uh, pretend that international borders don't exist, and the ability of leaders to declare, as President Putin seemingly has, uh, that another country doesn't have a right to exist. These are fundamental questions. We've heard from uh, the PRC its desire over the course of many decades to be a responsible stakeholder 
Uh, well, now is the time to answer that question, uh, and now is the time to show up. Because you mentioned some of the other ways that China could be pr providing material support. Has the U.S. to date seen any evidence that uh, that support has been anything but rhetorical? Have there been weapons uh, support provided? Has there been um, sanctions uh, support provided? We're going to continue to watch very closely. Uh, we offered an assessment uh, a couple weeks ago now that we had not seen the provision of weapons of supplies, uh, and that assessment has not changed. Sean. Uh, to the Middle East, sure. um, just as you're walking in, uh, the Israeli military says that they intercepted a rocket from Gaza. Um, I know you put out a statement on Jerusalem, I believe it was on Friday. Um, what's your, to begin with, what's your, what's your assessment of the situation? How worried is the United States that, uh, that this could flare up the way it did last year? Well, I did see that report just before uh, we walked in. Uh, to answer your question, in short, we are deeply concerned. We are deeply concerned uh, by the recent violence in Jerusalem uh, on the Haram al-Sharif Temple Mounts and across the West Bank. We, as we did on Friday, continue to call on uh, all sides to exercise restraint, to avoid provocative actions and rhetoric, and preserve the historic status quo on the Haram al-Sharif Temple Mount. We also continue to urge Israeli and Palestinian officials to work cooperatively uh, to lower tensions and ensure the safety of everyone. This department continues to closely follow the situation and continues to be in close contact with senior Israeli and Palestinian officials uh, to seek to de-escalate tensions. What I can tell you is that a number of senior officials across this government and certainly a number of uh, individuals across this building and our ambassadors and capitals uh, across the Middle East uh, were engaged in a series of uh, phone calls, including at very high levels over the weekend, again, with our Israeli partners, with our Palestinian counterparts uh, with other Arab uh, representatives in the region, including uh, our Jordanian partners, uh, uh, the custodian uh, of the Haram al, Haram al Sharif uh, Temple Mount, in an, in an effort uh, to see to it uh, that these tensions do not escalate. Can I just follow up? You mentioned Jordan. Uh, the Jordanian summoned the, the Israeli ambassador and said that, uh, or the Sharjah, the, and said that it was. Um, Calling it heavy-handed, the uh, the uh, the treatment that the Israelis had of the Palestinians at the uh, in Jerusalem. Um, do you share the assessment of the uh, of the Jordanians that this that things could have been handled differently? I'm not in a position to offer uh, a detailed assessment of um, operations on the Temple Mount Haram al Sharif. What I can say is that we have urged all sides uh, to preserve the historic status quo on the Haram al Sharif Temple Mount, uh, both in word. Uh, and in practice, and to avoid uh, steps that may be provocative and that may seek to, or that may inflame uh, tensions even further. Um, if nobody has a follow-up on that specifically. Anything else on this specifically? Okay. Uh, Iran? Sure. Uh, your counterpart in Tehran uh, said today that uh, the United States is behind the holdup in coming to, uh, to, to a revival of the JCPOA, re-entry of the United States into the JCPOA. Uh, do you have any response directly or indirectly to that? Do you, do you agree with the assessment that it's the U.S. that's holding up uh, uh, restoring this? We have said this consistently since the beginning. Uh, we are prepared to return, uh, we are prepared for a full return uh, to JCPOA, excuse me, we are prepared for a return to full JCPOA implementation. We are also prepared uh, for broader diplomatic efforts to resolve issues outside of the JCPOA uh, and this specific nuclear file. Uh, Deputy Secretary General Mora uh, of the EU's External Action Service continues to convey messages uh, and is working to bring these negotiations to a successful conclusion. Uh, we're not going to negotiate in public, but what we can say is that if Iran wants sanctions lifting that goes beyond the JCPOA, they'll need to address concerns of ours that go beyond the JCPOA. If they do not want to use these talks to resolve other bilateral issues, then we are confident we can very quickly reach an understanding on the JCPOA and begin to re-implement uh, the deal itself. It is Iran uh, that needs to make this decision. Any party, everyone who has been directly engaged in these talks knows which side has put constructive proposals on the table, knows which side uh, has negotiated and engaged in good faith, and knows which side has not. Can you just follow up on the, uh, the Revolutionary Guards issue? I know you said you're not going to negotiate publicly, but is this uh is this something in which the United States has made a firm decision on the uh, the FTO status? Uh, again, we're not going to negotiate in public. Uh, the Iranians know uh, where we stand on uh, the various issues at play. They also know uh, that we are seeking 
a mutual return to compliance with uh, the JCPOA. If they want to negotiate issues that fall outside the purview of the JCPOA, uh, then we'll do that, but they will need to negotiate those issues in good faith with reciprocity. Yes. Following up on um, Sean's questions, your Iranian counterpart also said that um, the environment or atmosphere of the talks, quote unquote, um, is not negative. Do you see that as a positive uh, assessment? Do you share at least that assessment? I don't think it's helpful for us to characterize the environment of the talks. There is really only one element that matters, and that is whether or not we're able to achieve a mutual return to compliance, whether we're able to get uh, across the finish line or not. At this point, it is unclear to us uh, whether we will be able to get there. We've spoken to the significant progress that had been achieved in recent weeks. Obviously, we've been uh, in a different position now for several weeks. That is why we're preparing equally for scenarios in which there is a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA and scenarios in which there is not a mutual return to compliance for the JCPOA. We would greatly prefer uh, the former, to have the JCPOA and the verifiable, the permanent limits that it would again impose on Iran's nuclear program. Whether we are able to get there or not, that is a question for Iran. One question on the Iranian president's comment today. He threatened Israel uh, and he said that if Israel makes a move against Iran, that it would uh, retaliate. Any comments on that? Well, uh, Iran, we know, is the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism. Its support for terrorism threatens international security and our partners throughout the region and elsewhere. Of course, that includes Israel. This administration's commitment to Israel's security is sacrosanct. We have uh, demonstrated that in a number of ways. And in cooperation with our allies and regional partners, including Israel, we will use every appropriate tool to confront the IRGC's destabilizing uh, role in the region, including uh, working closely with our partners in Israel. Yes. One in Ukraine, if I may. Uh, the first is on James Hill, uh, the U.S. citizen killed roughly a month ago in Kharkiv. His family says his remains are in Brussels and they've not been notified when they will be returned to the U.S. Is the State Department aware of this? Are they helping? What kind of assistance is being provided to them, uh, including uh, the return of his remains? So I'm not able to comment on specific cases, but I can tell you that our Bureau of Consular Affairs uh, routinely uh, and regularly uh, interacts with uh, Americans, with their families, including cases uh, of uh, illness or, uh, unfortunately, cases uh, of death. But I just don't have any additional details on this. And then secondly, can you please provide the latest on the State Department's role in planning for a senior level visit to Ukraine and how the recent strikes in Lviv and Kiev affected that planning process? Well, again, we don't have any travel uh, to confirm. We don't have any travel to announce or even to preview uh, at this point. Uh, but the fact remains that our coordination and our consultation with our Ukrainian partners uh, and our European uh, allies, as well as partners and allies around the world, uh, remains ongoing. It is con continuous. It is daily. And what I can say uh, is that uh, tomorrow, in fact, uh, you will see Deputy Secretary uh, of State Wendy Sherman traveled to Brussels. Uh, she'll be there from April 19th to April 22nd. Uh, she is going for the third high-level meeting of the e US-EU Dialogue on China uh, that will take place on April 21st. Uh, she'll also go for consultations uh, with our European uh, allies and partners uh, on the Indo-Pacific on April 22nd. Uh, but she will also, while there, engage uh, in Brussels with our NATO allies and EU partners to discuss our continued close coordination uh, on President Putin's war of choice uh, against Ukraine. So Secretary Blinken has spent more time in Brussels than any other city on the face of the earth, with the exception of Washington, D.C. Uh, Deputy Secretary Sherman uh, has spent a good deal of time there uh, herself. She'll be returning tomorrow, where, she'll, where she will remain uh, for several days, including uh, uh, by being engaged with our European allies uh, on the question of Russia's aggression uh, against Ukraine. Yes, sir. Is going to make that visit. It's been reported lately uh, many times that uh, the administration is considering sending high officials to Kiev. Is it uh, in the book? And if not, why? Well, the Secretary will make an important visit tomorrow. He will lead a U.S. delegation to Panama City, 
uh, to lead a ministerial conference on migration and protection co-hosted with the government of Pan Panama. Uh, we'll depart tomorrow morning. Uh, we will return uh, tomorrow evening. Uh, while in Panama, our delegation will join senior representatives from more than 20 other countries in the Western Hemisphere at the ministerial conference. Secretary Mayorkas of the Department of Homeland Security uh, will be in attendance uh, and helping to co-host this uh, as well. This is part of our effort uh, with countries from across the region uh, in recognition of our shared responsibility to address forced displacement and to manage irregular uh, migration. As we've discussed since uh, the beginning of this administration, our uh, migration management strategy uh, is a regional one, uh, addressing the root causes, the drivers uh, of migration from within the region. This will be an important follow-on to the discussions we had in Colombia last October, an important follow-on to discussions we had in Costa Rica uh, last year as well as we develop and implement with our partners in the region this migration management strategy. Sir. As I mentioned, a visit to Kiev, to uh, Ukraine, it's been reported lately that uh, you're uh, considering sending a high official to Kiev, is it? As I've said a number of times already today, we don't have any travel to announce, but we regularly engage with our Ukrainian partners uh, on, uh, the, uh, on our diplomacy, on their needs, on the ways we can continue to support uh, the uh, government and the people of Ukraine. Yes. Prime Minister to the United States on May 18. Uh, what will be the main issues in the discussions? Uh, can Turkey be part of the F-35 program again? Well, Turkey, of course, uh, is an important NATO ally. We've had many occasions in recent weeks to uh, consult with our uh, Turkish allies, including with Foreign Minister uh, Çavuşoğlu. Uh, Secretary Blinken regular, regularly uh, discusses um, a range of issues with him, including, of course, uh, Turkey's important role in holding Russia to account for uh, its war against the people, the government, uh, the state of Ukraine. I imagine uh, this upcoming opportunity would be an important element uh, as part of uh, that. But uh, together as NATO allies and important uh, bilateral partners, uh, there are a range of shared uh, interests uh, that we have with our Turkish por partners. So this is still a ways away, but I imagine there will be a, a very full agenda. When it comes uh, to the F-35 program, we've made our concerns with Turkey's uh, possession of the S-400 uh, system very clear. We do not believe the S-400 system is consistent uh, with the F-35 program. Uh, yes. Over the detainees, is the administration also seeking the release of U.S. legal permanent residents like Shahab Dalili, whose family has now gone public with his case? We have a number of concerns uh, with uh, the Iranian regime. At the top of that list, of course, uh, is its nuclear program and the challenge that its nuclear program, which has been able to gallop forward uh, since 2018, poses to. Uh, regional and international peace and security. Uh, but beyond that, of course, uh, we are focused on the release of uh, U.S. citizens. Uh, and there are four U.S. citizens uh, who remain unjustly uh, detained in Iran. Uh, we have, um, we are continuing uh, to do everything we can to see to it that these individuals are uh, returned to their families just as soon as is possible. Uh, there may be other cases that uh, we are prioritizing as well, but in the first instance, we're always going to prioritize uh, the safety, the security, the welfare, the well-being of, of American citizens, of U.S. citizens. Uh, yes. And just to stay in the region, um, is the U.S. concerned by reports that four Uyghur Muslims held in Saudi Arabia risk deportation to China? And has this been discussed with Saudi counterparts? Um, Across the world, we advocate against the involuntary return of predominantly Muslim Uyghurs uh, and members of other ethnic and religious minority groups to the PRC. Uh, we know that if returned, these individuals are at risk of detention, and potentially even torture. We will continue to urge partners to abide by their obligations under international law, including non-refoulement, and not return individuals from vulnerable populations to the PRC where they face genocide and crimes against humanity. elected president to step aside? Uh, John, I don't have a specific uh, reaction to that report, uh, but 
as you know, the special envoy has recently been in the region. He spent three weeks uh, in the region, and over the past year, uh, he has pressed for transparent, inclusive, Yemeni-led efforts to reform the government of Yemen, to ensure it meets the needs of all of its citizens, and to address their calls for justice, accountability, and redress for human rights violations on and abuses. On April 7th, earlier this month, we welcomed Yemen's establishment of a presidential leadership council. We urged that council to advance these goals in partnership with Yemeni civil society and members of marginalized communities. We also urge the leadership council to work closely with the prime minister to strengthen basic services and economic stability as soon as possible so that Yemenis across the country can receive tangible benefits from these recent reforms. Is representation important when it comes to leadership in Yemen? Well, uh, a representative government, a government that represents the people uh, and serves it effectively, uh, of course, is important, uh, both in Yemen and around the world. Sure. Uh, one of the things that Daryl also reported was that uh, former President Hadi has had his communication shut off and he's in a Riyadh Hotel. Does the United States have any information or, for that matter, concerns about how he's being treated? Uh, I don't have anything to share uh, on that. would refer you to the former president uh, or to uh, the Saudi government. Yes. I just wanted to follow up on something you mentioned at the top, the, the trip uh, involving um, Assistant Secretary Crittenbrink to the Pacific. Uh, is there anything sort of more concrete you can, that the, 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 that uh, delegation is going to be trying to uh, get out of those visits and wonder if you could sort of, you know, to, I don't think the announcement mentioned China, which is obviously uh, the backdrop to, to these visits, you know, how much, you, how much does this trip, this visit um, reflect a concern that China is, you know, growing in influence in that region? Well, these are three important Pacific uh, partners of the United States, Fiji, Papua New Guinea, and the Solomon Islands. It's uh, precisely why the Secretary uh, met with the Pacific Island Forum uh, earlier this year when we were in the region. And you're right that the announcement doesn't mention China because at the end of the day, uh, our policy uh, is not about China or any other country. It's about the partnership that the United States can bring. And part of our engagement, including in this upcoming context, is to ensure that our partners in the Indo-Pacific and around the world understand what the United States brings to the table, understands what a partnership uh, can bring, uh, and we'll leave it to them to contrast what we offer from what other countries, including rather large countries uh, in the region, might offer. Yes. prisoners apparently um, appealing for a prisoner swap. In Russia's case, it's two British nationals. In Ukraine's case, it's Viktor Medvedchuk. Is uh, the U.S. at all facilitating or engaged in conversations regarding a potential swap? I'm not aware of any role uh, there. The, uh, our Ukrainian partners have spoken to their level of engagement with Russia. Uh, you heard from Foreign Minister Kuleba yesterday uh, that these uh, engagements have been rather low level. They've been at the expert level. And we can all see very clearly that they have not demonstrated much promise just yet. That is not because both parties uh, are, are not prioritizing uh, diplomacy, are not prioritizing dialogue. Uh, there is one party that has consistently gone to the table in good faith, one party that uh, consistently has sought to bring an end uh, to this conflict, and another uh, that has engaged uh, in those diplomatic endeavors as little more than a pretense. Uh, another party, this being, of course, Russia, uh, that has continued to rain down uh, missiles and bombs and artillery against civilian populations, even as representatives of that government has continued uh, to sit down with uh, their Ukrainian partners. So this is a question that we will leave uh, to our Ukrainian partners to discuss uh, with their Russian uh, counterparts. Our goal is to see to it that we are doing everything we potentially can to strengthen Ukraine's hand at the negotiating table. And we're doing that in two principal ways. Number one, we're continuing to provide massive amounts of security assistance, $3.2 billion over the course of this administration, more than $2.5 billion since Russia's uh, most recent invasion of Ukraine began. Uh, and uh, at the same time, to hold Russia to account with uh, this set of economic sanctions, export controls, other measures uh, that we've imposed with dozens of countries around the world uh, to 
um, put Ukraine in a position to succeed and to induce Russia uh, to engage uh, in a way they have not yet, at least, and that is uh, in good faith and an effort to bring about this an end to this conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, is the U.S. aware of any U.S. citizens in Russian custody on Ukrainian soil currently? Uh, I am not uh, at the moment, yes. yes. Um, President Zelensky said over the weekend that if the remaining Ukrainian troops in Mariupol are destroyed, as Russia has threatened to do, that it could have it could put an end to all negotiations. You've obviously said that diplomacy is the only way ahead here. Would you support Ukraine if they withdrew from talks because of what the Russians do in Mariupol? At the end of the day, this is about Ukraine's independence. It's about Ukraine's sovereignty. It's about Ukraine's territorial integrity. Uh, there is no other country in the world, not Russia, not the United States, uh, not any of our European allies or partners who can make these decisions for Ukraine. Uh, this is a question for uh, the people of Ukraine, and their opinion will be expressed by uh, the government of Ukraine. Sure. I had a question earlier about the state, uh, the state sponsor of terrorism designation. You said uh, the administration will look at all potential options available to us under the law. Do you consider this designation as available to you, given the way that it's written in statute, the requirements in it? So I'm not in a position to offer an assessment of its applicability in this particular case, uh, but uh, there are certain authorities that are available to us under the law. We are going to evaluate the criteria that is uh, defined by statute against uh, the evidence and the facts. And if those evidence and the facts present an opportunity to use any particular authority, and if that authority will prove effective, we won't hesitate to do it. Yeah. There's one more sure. on um, TPS. Um, there's some reporting, um, senior Ukrainian officials saying that the date the TPS will be, uh, I guess, the cutoff point is being moved to April from March 1st. Can you confirm whether or not that's the case? We don't have any update. Uh, as you know, we recently did grant TPS to Ukrainians temporarily uh, in the United States. That uh, cutoff date was as of a particular date. If there is an extension or if that date changes, we will uh, let you know together with DHS. Yes. There's reporting today that Ukraine's most likely use cluster munitions. Is this something that the State Department is looking at, can confirm or deny, and what's the level of concern there? Uh, I've seen those reports. I'm not in a position to speak to them. I might refer you to the Department of Defense uh, if they have any additional context to offer. And of course, our Ukrainian partners uh, would be in the best position uh, to speak to this. Uh, what we can say is that this Russia's war against Ukraine has brought untold uh, brutality, has brought untold despair to the people of Ukraine. Uh, our Ukrainian partners, their service members, have fought valiantly, have fought effectively. They have done so with grit and determination, and they've also done so uh, with, an, un, with a, uh, an amount of support from the United States and the international community that is nearly unprecedented. Not in a generation has uh, so much security assistance flowed from the United States uh, to any other country. Uh, and that is because our support to our Ukrainian partners is ironclad, it is unwavering, we'll continue to provide them with what they need uh, to effectively take on uh, the challenge from uh, Russia, Russia's service members, uh, and, and Russia's aggression. But I just don't have anything for you on that particular report. Uh, yes? On the uh, Indo-Pacific trip of sure. the U.S. delegation, <clears throat> is uh, the Solomon Islands uh, intend to sign a security pact with uh, China a concern and is it going to be brought up on that trip is the u.s delegation going to prop possibly um ask the solomon islands uh, not to sign that pact like australia well i understand that we understand that the solomon islands and the prc are discussing a broad security related agreement building on recently signed police cooperation uh, despite the Solomon Islands government's comments, the broad nature of the security agreement leaves open the door uh, for the deployment of PRC military forces to the Solomon Islands. Uh, we believe that signing such an agreement could increase destabilization within the Solomon Islands and will set a concerning precedent for the wider Pacific Island region. We note that Australia and New Zealand have had longstanding law enforcement and security ties with uh, the Solomon Islands at the request of Prime Minister Sugavare an Australia-led multinational peacekeeping force from Fiji, New Zealand, and Papua New Guinea effectively restored calm to Honiara following the outbreak of violence and rioting in November of last year. This multinational group quickly aided uh, Solomon Islands and effectively supported a rapid return to peace. 
Uh, we've communicated with our allies and partners in the region, including, of course, with Australia and New Zealand, uh, which have expressed concerns about how this agreement may threaten uh, the current regional security paradigm. Part of uh, the task of the upcoming uh, uh, visit will be to uh, share perspectives, to share uh, interest to share uh, concerns, uh, and I, I do expect the full range of all of those will be uh, on the docket. And as you know, earlier this year, we also did announce uh, our intent to reestablish an embassy uh, on uh, in Honiara on the Solomon Islands uh, as part of that show of engagement, uh, part of that show of uh, U.S. support uh, for the Solomon Islands. And so I do expect uh, when our delegation travels there, they will continue and, and bring that message with them. Okay, uh, final question? Yes. yes on sanctions, uh, EU is planning to issue its next package of sanctions this week. Uh, should we expect the same uh, from Washington this week as well? And also, uh, is there any idea what is right now under review? Any unturned stone that we are considering right now to turn and uh, issue this, this week against Russia? I think you can expect that we will continue to escalate our financial sanctions and other economic measures against the Russian Federation until and unless uh, Moscow relents in its campaign against Ukraine. We have not yet uh, seen that and will continue to raise the cost. Thank you very much. I'm sorry? I don't have any timing, uh, timing to, uh, to, to add. Thank you all very much.